I've never been this loud before in my life. <laughs> yeah, that is me. Um, I've tried to meet as many people as I can so far, but I don't think I've met everyone. So that's me. I'm Asher Harvey Smith. I'm currently third of four years of computer science at the University of Warwick, which everyone is telling me to enjoy while I can. <laughs> and I'm sitting there surrounded by catch up with lectures, writing my project specification, writing this talk, thinking this is the good bit. <laughs> What's the real world like? I mean, I don't have to find out for another two years, thankfully. Um, and I was also uh, one of the summer interns at Dialogue, like Rich just said. Um, and that all started a little over a year ago. I was just sort of floating around on one of my university's programming forums. Um, and I saw people posting all these funny strings of messy ASCII. And it turned out it was J code. And I saw it and I thought, mm, that looks a bit silly. And then I saw some more. And then I saw a little bit more. And eventually I caved and I said, OK, teach me. What is going on here? And then one thing led to another. I learned some J. I learned some of the other languages. Eventually I was like, oh, this is all based on this thing called APL. And I found out, ooh, Dialog is based in the UK. All of my friends are getting internships, and I don't have one yet. <laughs> so I tried my luck, and to my astonishment, they said yes. And so early July, I came down to Bramley and I started interning. And I got up to all sorts of things. So the interpreter is obviously written in C, and I know C. But I also knew APL, and I wanted to do both. So on the C side, the very first thing I had to do was learn just how everything works, because the interpreter is, I mean, you all saw Richard's talk yesterday. It's very interesting. It's, it's a bit of a beast to work with. He showed me a very early version of that talk to sort of get me on board. I had to learn all about how the pocket structure works and stuff, and I tried. I did some little, little projects just to get up and running with it. And then I was finally given a real task. And all of this stuff, unfortunately, you can't use right now. But come sort of version 20, everything on here, you'll be able to actually give a go. So the first thing I got up to was extending input and end get so that they could work with matrices. Because right now, you can load everything in as just one big string if you want to when you're using end get. Or you can load it in as a vector of vectors. But sometimes you've got this nice fixed width data or you don't mind just having padding spaces and stuff. And so now we can load that in directly from the file without having to go through the overhead of constructing this big web of vectors and then doing a mix. You can just do it straight up. And likewise, you can just give a matrix straight to input, and it will send it down to the disk. So that was good fun. And then the second thing I did was quad NS. Right now, if you want to copy something into a namespace, you've got to give the name of the namespace as a left argument which is a little bit strange. Uh, so now I extended it so that you can give a reference to, as the left argument as well, <laughs> uh, which is quite nice. And actually, yesterday, watching Adam's talk, I realized this is the very first overload of that massive set of overloads he had planned for Quad NS. So I've unintentionally started the ball rolling on that. If anyone's got objections to the designs, I'm not going to say too late. But <laughs> um, Funny thing about that, it actually didn't work when I coded it. I coded it all up in, I think, the second to last week that I was there. And then I left, went back to university, got an email a few weeks later saying, oh, yeah, this actually breaks the Windows build. I was like, oh, OK, not my problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Silas, your job. Um, and on the APL side, um, you know, finally not having to worry about pointers or anything, really early on in the internship, I was there during the tools group week or the, the conclave, I think we called it, where people sort of descended on Bramley from all over the world, and everyone was introducing to each other all the different tool stuff that was going on. You know, and you guys will learn all about that stuff today, Jarvis, et cetera. And that was really interesting for me, because I knew none of that. I came along to dialog, sort of knowing how to use the primitives, and that was kind of it. And then all of a sudden, within a week, I knew everything. And the thing that really fascinated me about that week was when we were talking about the Jupyter kernel. Uh, you saw Jesus was talking about some of the Jupyter notebook stuff before. I, I saw the same kind of teaching potential in that and thought, I have to have a go at this. So I came to Morton and I said, hey, I want to I wanna make some educational materials in the Jupyter notebook, please. And Morton said, go for it. So I, I, was, really, I was really lucky for that. Um, while I was working with it, though, I bumped into some problems. Turns out both the Jupyter kernel and, as we'll see in a moment, try APL have different distinct hacks 
for working with multi-line cells. So I, I did some work to try and make them work together. And my main thing, as I was saying, was I made these Jupyter notebooks for learning linear algebra. So a great thing about TriAPL, if I just come over to it now, is, oh, this mouse is working, is if you want to, if you've got a link to any sort of Jupyter notebook, so I've left my, this link here in the slides if anyone wants to try it. I think you get access to the slides afterwards. You can just stick a link in, hit enter, and it just loads up. So this is a Jupyter Notebook running within TriAPL. I don't know who implemented this, but whoever did, thank you so much. It's amazing. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole notebook now. We do not have time for that. But you can just come along, and as soon as you get to code cells, there you go. They get put into the session. And one thing that's, oops, one thing that's especially nice is when you get, let me see, you get a little bit further down, Look at this. This is a LaTeX expression. This is a mathematical formula just sitting in there. And that's extremely cool and extremely useful. Now, if you, I'm not going to click through the whole thing now. But if any of you want to afterwards, go stick it in. If you go down eventually, you'll see some more impressive formulas in there. And it just appears there right next to the APL sessions. I love it. And once I'd made those, I, um, I left Dialog, went back to university, and I, was, I thought I would need to test these out. Because I just sort of, in theory, they work. But I haven't actually seen if this is an actually effective method of teaching. So I went back. I gathered together a bunch of my classmates. And I said, hey, do you want to learn APL? And they gave me some funny looks. <laughs> and I said, I'll buy you a pint if you let me teach you some APL. <laughs> and then I got some people in there. Um, so I, I managed to gather together a few people in a room. We had sort of, I had sort of a whiteboard set up at the front where I was scribbling down these um, these glyphs, and everyone was set up in a sort of horseshoe shape. Uh, everyone had a ride session in front of them, and it actually went really well. It went much better than I was expecting. I'm not going to go through the whole structured thing right now, but this is roughly the progression we followed. So I started everyone off with just arithmetic. Um, you know, just these simple scalar operations, that sort of thing. And then said, OK, we can also have vectors of things. And then we touched on scalar extension. And we, there was reductions. There's actually an interesting, um, as a sort of pedagogical note, if you're teaching about reductions, don't do what I did and call them insert. Because the way I sort of introduced it was I said, if you've got plus slash one, two, three, that's like you're inserting in between the numbers. So I said that's 1 plus 2 plus 3, which is kind of correct. That gets the message across. But it meant that then when I wanted people to just uh, use a binary operation on two different things, instead of doing, say, this, they're instead trying to do, if I can type, this, which is not right. And it's especially not right when you want your result to be not a scalar of a reduction. So that was causing a bunch of trouble. So uh, if anyone's bumped into that one teaching it before, probably best to have an analogy to the summation notation, your big sigma, rather than the insert thing. So linear combinations was where it showed up, because you've got to multiply two things together and then do a sum. So people were trying to do plus reduce times reduce, and it just wasn't working. And then we moved on to matrices and said, what if you have more than one dimension to your array? That means she's indexing, all that kind of thing. And it's worth noting at this point that the people I was teaching had seen all this linear algebraic stuff before. I was mostly just using it as a sort of scaffolding to say, here's this mathematical thing you've seen before. Let me introduce you to this new notation for it that you can effectively use for other things. So we got to inner products. And then I said, OK, you, you all know how to invert a 2 by 2 matrix. Try writing your first DFUN to do it. And then I said, OK, congratulations, you've written your first DFUN. But that only works on 2 by 2 matrices. If you want it to work on n by n matrices, then you've got to bring in your domino. Um, then finally, I said, da, there's this equivalence between with domino and divide. Because if you've got a divided by b, that is the same thing as reciprocal of b times a. And I said, the same thing applies. 
when we were already doing inverting a matrix and then multiplying it by another matrix to solve something, you can actually just do the same thing. Oop. If I can type, there we go. And people found that sort of equivalence really helpful. And at that point, I sort of left people alone. I said, look, I've taken you all the way from arithmetic to now you're solving arbitrarily large linear systems with just one symbol. And people quite liked feeling that progress. The outcomes of it were, at the start, when I was teaching the arithmetic, I was going into it assuming people are not going to like this. People are going to think that APL is too weird. They're not going to like the associativity. They're not going to like that everything can be called either monadically or dyadically. But it turns out people are actually more open-minded than I was expecting. So I paced it really slow at the beginning. I went through it saying, get used to this. It's not, used to, it's not what you're expecting. But then it was fine. Um, and especially people wanted to get through that more quickly and get on to doing the exercises um, that I was setting along the way. Because along the way, I said, OK, you've learned this thing. Try and do this slightly different thing. But there wasn't really enough of that. People wanted more. People wanted to actually get down doing things, um, especially when it was getting introduced. Whenever people learned a new concept, they wanted more of an opportunity to apply it because a lot of the feedback I got was saying having, um, having something that you're trying to achieve is really helpful. Having this context of we know linear algebra, how can we do it in this new way and to get these examples done really quickly was very, very helpful. And another thing that I think is kind of unique to APL is at universities right now, there's this kind of split between your learning and your doing. You know, you'll spend a couple of hours in a lecture just sort of having a professor speak at you, and then you've got to sort of take it all in. And if you're lucky, later on in the week, you'll have an hour where some poor underpaid postgrad will do their best to help you actually do some computations or something. And it'll usually be in something completely different to what you've learned in a lecture. You know, you'll have to crack out Python or something where you've been looking at some mathematical formula actually in the lecture. But being able to do both at once, you know, if I was, I was here with the board saying, here's the math, here's how you do it, and then people typing in the exact same thing and getting it done was really, really helpful. Um, and that's something that's sort of missing, I think, in a lot of education right now. Unfortunately, though, it can't really do anything, uh, everything. It can do a lot of things. Um, you're limited to these finite computable things. In linear algebra, if you want to talk about a vector space, you can talk about that abstractly. You can talk about that on a blackboard, but you can't have a vector space as an object sitting there. You can have the basis of a vector space, because that's just three vectors. It's nice and easy. But you can't have an infinite number of vectors sitting in an array. That doesn't work. Um, but don't take my word for how it went. I'm not going to read out all of these. That would be overly self-congratulatory, I think. But you've got, I think you're going to have access to the slides afterwards, so you're able to see how it all goes. People were quite happy with it. I especially like this last one here. This was nice. <laughs> Believe it or not, uh, the person who left this response, I know him quite well. He actually enjoyed the session the most out of everybody, and is now, um, as part of a project he's doing, writing an essay on combinatorial logic in J. So he really got into it after all this. So, you know, uh, don't discount that kind of feedback. Um, so this is just a little thing I did, really. I wrote one little course and I presented one little session to people. But I think this is part of um, sort of the very early steps of what my take on getting APL into academia is all about. So I think we're currently at sort of stage one where people know stuff about their own domain. You know, these people I was teaching, they already knew linear algebra, you know. And you know, there's all sorts. You can take physics students who already know about some physics thing. I don't know. Um, but they don't know APL yet. So stage one of getting people using APL is to say, look, you can use APL for this thing that you're already doing. And it's really, really helpful. And right now, we're doing that very well. You know, there's, Jesus was talking about all the amazing stuff he was doing. Marcus was talking about the stuff he was doing. We've got lots of evangelism going on with Adam and Rich. And we're sort of spreading APL out there with the idea that one day it's a thing that enough people are using 
that we can spring on to what I'm thinking of as stage two, which is, ooh, that's the wrong way. There we go. So stage two is when people sort of know APL at least a little bit. You know, everyone's, a lot of people have sort of heard of it and people realize that it's a tool you can use and people don't just see it as some weird squiggly historical relic, um, if they've even heard of it at all. And at that point, once people know some of that, you can say, all right, you already know how to do this thing in APL. Let me show you how to expand it. And you can instead, you're building the other way. Instead of going from domain knowledge to APL knowledge, you've got your APL knowledge and you're building up the domain knowledge. And I think if we're looking into uh, sort of a farther on ideal future, you could have a situation where in a lecture, you've got a professor showing you some mathematical formula and showing you something that's actually almost equivalent as an APL expression. And then when you're going away to do an assignment or something, or even if you're going away to do sort of graduate level research, you don't have to go through all the friction of adapting the theory that you've learned in a lecture setting to something you can actually compute with. It's just already there. You can just go copy, paste, and you're done. And there it is working and suddenly actually doing computations with the theory you've learned is so much easier. And that's kind of aspirational right now. We're not close to that yet, but I hope one day we can be because I would personally have a lot more fun learning like that than having to do whatever else one newfangled thing you have to do nowadays. Um, so that I think is roughly all I had. I think I speak a lot more quickly in front of an audience than I do in my bedroom. Because um, <laughs> that, that went on longer when I practiced it. But thank you anyway all for listening. And also, while I've got everyone stuck in the room, I want to say thank you to Dialogue for hosting me at the internship this year. Because I have talked to my classmates. And believe me, I had the best internship of them all. So <laughs> thank you all for that.